so much, Mayor, for taking the time. I know you've got a busy schedule, so we'll dive right in. All right. Um, speaking about the Tenderloin, the Tenderloin has struggled for a long time. Overdoses citywide have been skyrocketing over the past two years. So why did you declare the emergency in December, perhaps as opposed to earlier? And, and what was the final straw for you at that time? Well, initially, um, unfortunately, the option to declare a state of emergency, which we had looked into uh, for some time now, wasn't available to us. And I definitely pushed and pushed and pushed, mostly because when we look at the data of the number of drug overdoses uh, throughout the course of the time when COVID existed, where we saw you know, less um, COVID deaths than we did uh, the number of overdoses within the same time, that, of course, was very alarming and, to me, established a possible case that we clearly are in crisis and we're addressing uh, the um, COVID crisis in a way that has urgency. And because of our swift action and everything that we put into place, we were able to have, although one of the densest cities in the country, one of the lowest death rates in the country. And so the fact that we uh, couldn't apply that initially to what was happening with people who were dying from drug overdoses in San Francisco was very problematic to me. Um, initially, before we were given the green light that we could do a state of emergency, my plan was to move uh, swiftly to try and set up this linkage center to add more uh, police officers, to increase the number of ambassadors, and to really start to meet people where they are and deal with the challenges of what were happening in the Tenderloin. But the sad reality, before we had the ability to declare the state of emergency, we weren't going to be able to move as fast as we did. And more specifically, with the Linkage Center, bringing all the various agencies, nonprofit and public health and uh, the public sector together, we brought them all together in one location that allowed people to walk in and to get help and to get support. So that was really a big deal. Um, in addition, separately from the declaration of emergency, we pushed to increase the number of law enforcement in the area. And the sad reality is that as soon as we moved to do that, there were a large number of people who got the Omicron variant. So we had a number of police officers and city employees in general out, so we weren't able to move on our plans as quickly as we had wanted to, um, but we are now starting to see increase in law enforcement, increase in ambassadors and other services and cleaning and stuff in the tenderloin, and my hope is that over time we'll see a significant difference. The Linkage Center was obviously a key part of the emergency. Uh, the data that we had gathered during the time of the emergency was just over 180 completed linkages out of 15,600 visits. If the goal is linking people to services, why is this number pretty low? What, what can and needs to be done to improve it, and how will you hold staff? Well, you know what the difference, well, just the reality is, you know what the difference is, that the, you may consider the numbers low, but for those people that we were able to help, it's all the difference. And that's the difference between doing nothing whatsoever. This is a new thing that we are trying with the whole purpose of making sure that people know that there's a system set up to try and get people into help and treatment. And it takes time and it takes building trust and building a relationship. When we deal with the challenges of various tenant encampments, we don't just go in and start breaking down tenant encampments. We have to go in, we have to establish rapport, we have to develop a relationship. And we're talking about people who struggle from addiction, from mental health challenges. So just because we show up and just because we're there to help doesn't mean that someone's gonna instantly accept what we're offering. The goal is to build up a relationship and, and to build trust over time and to get people into the help or the support that they might need. So I'm really proud of what the people who are worked in the Linkage Center have done to try and help people and get them into treatment. It's something that we have to continue to work towards because doing nothing and doing things the way we've done has led to you know, a, a decline in the number of people that we have been able to help. So as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, I think that the Linkage Center is doing a really good job. Do you think that there is a, enough resources to help those people? Is that, is that part of the problem that you're encountering when it comes to housing or treatment? Well, I think we could always use more resources, but we have, because of the declaration of emergency, we've been able to hire over 200 behavioral health 
uh, persons to add to um, what we're already doing. People who deal with th those who have trauma, who have other challenges, and we were able to move swiftly. It took a couple months versus possibly a year to get that many people um, hired through the city and county of San Francisco. So, of course, there's always more because it is not easy. Helping one person sometimes involves a number of people and, 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 and moving parts uh, and so the reality is we have to meet people where they are and part of that is understanding what they're going through and linking them to the right services and sometimes that takes time and, and that involves people who know what to do in order to get them linked to services. You came out strongly in December when announcing the emergency and declaring the emergency, uh, a few quotes would be, quote, make life hell, unquote, for people committing violence, dealing or openly using drugs. You said that people who would be using in broad daylight would be given a choice to go to the place designated for them or to jail. Since then, data and interviews with police and residents and officials have not shown that this is, is widely happening, these specific policies and this kind of enforcement. We are aware of the staffing challenges with Omicron and the entire department, but why did this not happen even with existing officers? So I think, you know, there, you know, again, everyone has their own opinion based on what they think should or shouldn't happen. And the fact is we were challenged significantly with the number of officers who were out because at the end of the day, we have to cover the entire city and we didn't have the ability to move officers around the way that we are currently able to do so. Uh, but when you look at almost 500 arrests and the amount of fentanyl that has been seized and taken off the streets, when you look at the people who have been provided a alternative, either in some cases, depending on the situation they were in, they were given the option uh, to go sometimes to get support at San Francisco General, which then clogs up the hospitals and make it difficult for us to help people um, in general, and so having the linkage center as an option to get people off the streets, that's something we've been able to do. Uh, I, I gotta tell you, regardless of what you think is the case, the fact that I am hearing from residents randomly about being able to walk down the street and take their kids to the park, or not being as afraid as they were, or feeling like things are getting better, they're not perfect, of course. This is. This problems, these problems in the tenderloin have existed since before I was even born. And so they're not just gonna all of a sudden disappear with three months. And I think it's really unfortunate that you have people who just wanna be critical for the sake of, well, it's not happening fast enough. Nothing has changed. Well, you don't live there. The people who live there are the ones who know whether or not something is making the difference. The people who actually work there and spend every single day because they have no choice those are the people who actually need to be consulted because they see and feel a difference in comparison to how bad it was before. And it's not to say that it's over. It's not to say that it's completely cleaned up. It's to say that we have to continue to be as assertive as possible to get to a better place. But I gotta say the feedback that I'm getting from the people who are basically at ground zero of all of this stuff that's going on, you know, they wanna see more, of course. Uh, but they are glad that attention is finally being paid to their community. And have officers been arresting people who did not want to go to the Lincoln Center or refuse resources like you said could happen? Well, I think part of it is, you know, from my understanding, the focus from our police department has been on the people who have been mostly dealing the drugs. And they definitely have had their hands full with folks um, and making those arrests and seizing not only the drugs, but the weapons. Uh, because of the amount of violence that has occurred in this particular community. Um, so at this time, that has been their primary focus. And we have mostly used many of our resources, including people from our wellness teams, from our overdose prevention teams, from our street crisis uh, teams. They have been the ones who have been more focused on the people who have been kind of sprawled out on the streets and struggling in, in various capacities. And so working with a lot of those different groups, they have provided that alternative to policing touch in order to try and get people off the streets. You said pretty clearly in December, the option is gonna be linkage center or jail. Is that something that you would like to see? Or of course that's not something I'd like to see, but what we can't continue to allow is 
for people to have the, the choice of being able to um, you know, create challenges, block sidewalks and create challenges with the quality of life of what's happening in neighborhoods because we're not just talking about you know, people who are laid out on the sidewalk and many of us wanting to help and folks wondering why the city isn't helping. We're also talking about the random drug-induced attacks where people unfortunately um, um, have assaulted uh, folks because of whatever their uh, particular situation, whether they're mentally ill or high off drugs. And so that's why it's so important that we are more proactive and not waiting until an incident occur. And do you think police have a role to play in that if people do, do not want to comply or continue their behavior? I think the role that we want police to play is to identify that there is a problem and to call the appropriate party to deal with the problem. Because again, part of what we have done with these various teams of people is to provide an alternative to policing. Because we know that police officers are not social workers. And so having social workers, clinicians, paramedics, and those kinds of people who can provide a service differently and to convince, in some cases, people to accept what we're offering, that is really our ultimate goal. So did you mean what you said in December then, that people could be, the alternative could be jail? I meant everything that I said, because I think that when, and when we talk about alternative could be jail, what we're talking about is when people break the law, in possession of drugs, selling drugs, you know, those kinds of, those are crimes. And so part of what we need to be prepared to do, if someone is committing a crime and creating problems for a particular community, we want to, of course, see what we can do to help first, but if that's not an option, we need to use every tool within our disposal to get that person into treatment or into an environment that's going to lead to change and not just leave people on the streets in the ways that we have in the past. And regarding drug dealing, many residents do wonder why drug dealing is basically allowed to operate in the middle of the city. What would you say to that? And I, I would say that we are doing the very best we can. If you look at the data, which I'm sure you have, you will see that not only have there been a number of arrests, almost 500 since this declaration of emergency, but there have been a number of people who have been uh, arrested multiple times. Um, and I will tell you, you know, this is quite frustrating. The city can't handle this situation. We're doing the best we can. We need the district attorney. We need the courts. We need them to do their part. We need the federal government to, to step in and to help us. I'm getting complaints from federal employees about the conditions of the area surrounding their buildings. And what I say is, you know, where's the help from them too? Because we all play a role in helping to address this. I think that for the most part, the police department of San Francisco has been primarily um, the responsible party for addressing this crisis when there are a lot of people that have a role to play that if we are working together, we can really make change. And this is not just about locking everyone up and throwing away the key. This is about providing alternatives so they're not out there dealing drugs or in, in some cases, if they're arrested over and over again, eventually there needs to be consequences. But let's also talk about the violence, the, vi the stabbings, the shootings, the killings. Because in many cases, you know, even our own uh, ambassadors, Urban Alchemy, they've been assaulted, shot, and stabbed um, by just trying to keep the community safe. So things have gotten increasingly violent, and it can't just be on the police. We need additional support to get to a point where we can make sure that people are held accountable and we're able to provide alternatives. What else would you like to see the DA or the courts do to help them? Well, again, part of it is, for example, you know, I have a friend who sadly um, was killed in a tenderloin. He was chased, he was beat, he was held down. A lot of this is on tape. Two of the three suspects were arrested and those two people are now out on the streets. And so for me, I'd like to see a change. Um, it can't just, um, especially when we talk about people who um, are violent and, and what they could potentially do to someone else. They clearly have the ability to do it and if they're able to get away with committing murder or any acts of violence, then that's gonna be a problem. So I'd like to see a lot more um, 
from both our DA and the courts, and I'd like to see a lot more federal support to help us deal with what is clearly a crisis. And what is your opinion of how the DA is doing its job and, and how that's impacting? I'm not going to get into an opinion one way or another. My goal is to work with the district attorney. I do want to see more from him, and I do want to see more from the courts. And I don't want to be put in a political football of back and forth when the fact is, at the end of the day, as leaders of this city, we have a responsibility to protect the public and to make sure people are safe. And our criminal justice system plays a critical role in doing that. We can have reforms. We can provide people with second chances. We can make sure that we provide alternatives so that people aren't out here committing these crimes in the first place. But when the lines are crossed, there has to be consequences. And do you have a position on his recall? No. And you have obviously said that the DA and the courts, there's a lot of people in the criminal justice system who have responsibility here. The police also have that responsibility. We've heard from some residents and businesses that they feel they've been frustrated that cops either don't always respond, or if they do, they don't always do anything, or maybe punt, punt to the DA. Do you believe that this is an issue? And if so, how are you addressing it? Well, it's, it's really challenging because I, I get a lot of mixed messages. And in some cases, you know, I will see, um, you know, the information about the various arrests, the videos on the various arrests and how the police have, you know, handled these situations. Um, but then you also hear from people about different scenarios where they feel that they made a call and nothing was done. And in some cases, if a crime is not committed, there isn't anything the police can do. They can't make an arrest based on, you know, what, you know, someone says unless it involves something violent or an assault or something of that nature. So I, I think that there's a lot of mixed messages out there. Um, we try to do our very best to focus on what the law is and to respond to people and to address those challenges. But, you know, for example, if someone is laying in front of someone's business, that's no reason to arrest someone. We would have to basically go in and say, look, we need you to move. And, and there's a whole conversation, I'm sure, that occurs to get that person to move and to also potentially find out if that person needs services. But ultimately, it's not that simple. And we're doing the very best we can. You mentioned Urban Alchemy. Your administration has definitely turned to them, especially in the Tenderloin. I've heard a lot of praise of their work and also some criticism that they are simply move issues to other blocks. You can usually see the dividing line in the Tenderloin. And in some cases, they're essentially doing the job of police. Why have you turned to them? And what's your response to some of that criticism? Well, I wouldn't say that I turned to them um, when they came onto the scene. I mean, before they came onto the scene, um, things were very much challenging in, in this area. They were very helpful initially in the Civic Center area and around many of our public toilets. Uh, and I got to say, their relationship, building relationships, understanding the community, knowing the stories about the challenges that they face, uh, they bring a more personal perspective because in many cases, many of these folks have, you know, been out there themselves. And part of what they want to do is they want to help. But more importantly, they draw a line. Like, they're not going to tolerate certain behaviors that infringe upon the ability for the people of the community to be able to walk down the street safely, to be able to get into a restaurant or to do their laundry at a laundromat. Like, we're talking about basic things that other neighborhoods take for granted that sadly have been problematic in the tenderloin for families with children, for elderly people. And their goal is to be the eyes and the ears on the streets, to have conversations. I mean, no one's talking about the number of people who would have overdosed had it not been for the people of Urban Alchemy, had it not been for the people of Urban Alchemy administering Narcan to help bring people back to life. And the police have done that as well. No one's talking about how, you know, elderly people, you know, will hold the hand of an Urban Alchemy employee just to walk across the street just because it made them feel that much safer. So they're a part of the fabric of this community. They've been doing an extraordinary job. And more importantly, they treat people with respect. Even if you are someone who potentially is committing a crime or someone who is being problematic. They still have treated people with respect and they're doing the best they can. What about the f criticism that they simply move problems around? 
I think part of it is the blocks that they're able to hold, they're able to hold, but they can't be everywhere. We can't be everywhere, and we're doing the best we can. I wouldn't suggest that it's about moving it from one place to another. It's about disrupting behavior and making people feel uncomfortable and making it more difficult for people to commit crimes on these various blocks where they've been allowed to do so for far too long. In a recent interview, speaking of, of Chase Boudin, you did express some criticism for more uh, wealthy and white progressives, including Chase Boudin and some members of the board. What frustrates you most about some of the far left politics? Well, to be clear, I wasn't suggesting that Chesa was wealthy. Um, but there are, you know, in, in many cases, as I said, a lot of people who have not lived through these experiences. They may have empathy and they care and they want to see change, but it's important to also understand from people who've actually had to live in these experiences and the people who currently live. It's not about telling them what they want. It's about listening to them to understand what they need. So when I had a chance to talk, just because I grew up in an environment that was somewhat similar, you know, I didn't assume to understand or know everything that people are dealing with in the Tenderloin. Part of it was to listen and to understand their various stories and perspective and to make sure that I understood what they wanted me to do and that they understood what I could and couldn't do and having a real conversation about that and not just imposing something on people. It was just about what it is you want to see, what's happening there, and how are we going to turn things around. And I think you know the frustration sometimes um, with people who have never had to live through these types of experiences is you know they see it, they empathize with it, and then they think that they're the savior for the situation when in fact the people who are actually experiencing it can be their own saviors if we only would work together to try and figure out solutions to empower and support and uplift them in their plight to see changes in their neighborhood. Speaking of some differences with progressives, especially more progressive members of the Board of Supervisors, mm -hmm. you have clashed on some decisions about housing when they have uh, rejected some proposals to streamline housing or create new developments. Most of them would say that they don't think that creating market rate housing is going to address the city's deep affordable housing crisis. What's your response to that and, and how, if at all, do you think market rate is a part of the solution? So I would just say it goes back to growing up here in San Francisco. Um, the fact is, you know, there are a lot of people who grew up in this city who sadly can't afford to live here. And they can't afford to live here is because in many cases, housing production has been stalled considerably. And at the end of the day, would I like to only build affordable housing? Yes. But sadly, based on the lottery system and the challenges of even getting access to what we build, the people who, again, grow up here and who can't afford to get, live here can't even get sometimes in the affordable housing that's supposedly built for them. And from my perspective, we need to build housing of all income levels. And we need to be as aggressive as we possibly can. And let me just give you an example. When we focused on jobs, jobs, jobs in San Francisco, between 2010 and 2015, it was all about jobs. And, between, and, and during that time, we created, for every eight jobs, one unit. And then what we saw in my community, lines of people for one apartment, bidding wars that drove up the prices because we weren't building housing, we weren't adding anything to the housing stock, we were only creating this new, innovative tech job market and prices started to skyrocket. And so, you know, regardless of how you feel, at the end of the day, housing of all income levels is necessary in order to ensure that there is a balance, to ensure that access to opportunity to exist. It shouldn't just be about being able to compete in a lottery to get a unit that you can afford. Anyone at one point in time in the city could actually rent a unit in the Tenderloin and be okay, or rent a unit in the Western Edition without going through some sort of affordable housing lottery process. And so that's what's missing here. You know, people who have the luxury, you know, which is every member of the Board of Supervisors, they could pretty much live wherever they want to live and rent whatever they want to rent, but what about those people who can't? And why are we stopping the ability to get housing built in San Francisco just because we think that it all should be affordable, knowing 
we don't have the sufficient resources to ensure that that's the case because it is so expensive to build in San Francisco. We need a balance, we need to do both, and we need to move more aggressively than we ever have to get more housing built. Tell me back quickly to public safety. What's your response to those who question whether you've changed your stances on policing when we look at 2020, redirecting some funding from police to 2022 when you're advocating for more budget and for more officers? So I think, you know, it's not really a fair assessment because let's take it back even further. My work before I was even an elected official, when people were dying, sadly, in the Western Edition community, the gun violence was rampant. That was a lot of my work and my advocacy, and that translated to dollars and resources that I pushed for when I was a member of the Board of Supervisors, including rewards to help find and, and arrest and convict many of the killers of, of, of people who have lost sons and daughters and family members to gun violence, which unfortunately is still happening. And what our community came together to do is develop a good relationship with the police because we wanted the crimes in our community to be treated equitably, the same as any crime any place else in the city. That has not changed. And what, what, what happened when I pushed to take money from law enforcement agencies, not just the police, to move over to specifically support the African American community, it had everything to do with the disparities that exist in this community as it relates to law enforcement. The number of officer-involved shootings, the number of um, use of force cases, the number of arrests, the number of those who are in our criminal justice system, even though African Americans represented at the time less than 6% of the population. There was a clear, huge disparity and a need to make more investments in this community. It can't just be okay, African Americans represent less than 6% of the population in San Francisco, so they should get 6% of the new housing when they barely even get access to 1%, right? It, 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 but you look at the number of homeless people who are African American, it's almost 40%. There's a huge disparity and we're not answering the call with how we invest dollars and how we support this population. So my push was to bring attention to this disparity at a time when a, a light was being shined on it in such a way that I knew it would be impactful, that I knew it would make a difference. And through the Dream Keepers initiative, it has been making a difference. It did not mean that we did not want police to serve and protect not only the city, but the African American community. We just wanted to make sure that they weren't unfairly victimized by law enforcement. And so you can do changes to police policies, reforms, and make changes so that all communities feel protected. And you can also make sure that you address crime because no one wants to be a victim of violent crime. No one wants to be a victim of violent crime, whether it's someone in your own community or it's the police department. So we have to strike a balance. We don't have to choose one or the other. Both can happen at the same time. And so my push is not only to make sure that this community is supported and uplifted and what we see in terms of the data around our criminal justice system has changed, it's also to make sure that we have what we have now as we increase the number of officers, a more diverse workforce, a, a workforce who represents and understands the community and who's willing to work with people of various backgrounds all throughout San Francisco. And we have been working hard to get to a better place with law enforcement and ultimately we want every single person in this city to feel safe. Part of that is definitely law enforcement, but the other part of that is making sure we invest in alternatives to ensure that people never get to those points in the first place. And when you said you meant what you said in December that sometimes the, the other option could be jail. We, we haven't necessarily seen that yet for people refusing services. So is that something that we can expect? So I think you're, 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 you're trying to make it into something it isn't. Because if, 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 someone, if someone is not accepting services, that is not against the law. If someone is in possession of drugs, illegal substances, the ability to make a decision to either say, look, we have an alternative for you, or 
you know, if you don't want to accept this alternative. And it's going to be depending on the situation and it's going to be based on the discretion of, of the officers. The goal is to bring in alternatives, to bring in our street wellness teams or our street crisis teams or a team that can work with this person. But they do have the option if someone is in possession of an illegal substance. We're not talking about just arresting people who are not committing crimes. We're talking about trying to help people, and if we have that as an alternative, depending on the situation, we'll make a judgment call. And I've spoken with cops who don't necessarily agree with that approach. Do you think that the, the force is uh, in favor of this policy? I can't speak for what the force is or individual cops are in favor of. I can only speak to the directive I've provided. The directive is we're going to do everything we can to provide alternatives and give people the support and the treatment that they meet, need. But if they are in some ways, you know, crossing the line and, 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 and breaking the law, we reserve the right to make a decision based on the situation whether or not there's an arrest. Our goal is not to arrest. Our goal is to get people help and treatment. But when those lines get crossed, we have a decision to make. And this is entirely separate subject, but have, are you considering a run for higher office, whether it be Pelosi or Feinstein, if it opens up, or a job in the Biden administration? I'm not considering that at this time. 